Hello. All right, guys, we're going to get started here. All right, so we have some students here. If you're wondering why I have a microphone, it's because we have a live stream going too, and they want to be able to hear what's going on. So we are going to be using microphones. We're going to start with 45 minutes of uh, a message, a lesson, if you will, and then we'll end it with a 15-minute Q&A. All right? So with that, we're going to have Russ come on up here. Let's give him a, a round of applause, would you? This is Russ Hansen. I am so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. As he said, my name is Russ Hansen. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin from Platteville with a degree in geology. I worked as an oil geologist for many years. And then after that, we traveled for about 20 years, giving lectures in universities and colleges, camps and schools and churches around the United States for about 20 years. And uh, I would like to try to touch on as many different subjects as possible within the very broad scope of creation science. So we're going to get started. One of the, one of the verses that really catches me on my eye when I'm thinking about creation science is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's, Paul says to Timothy, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and, and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. There are a lot of fables in our world, right? A lot of things people say, well, this could be true, that could be true. There's really only one truth, right? He says in... in uh, Psalms 119, oops, I should turn that on. It says, or in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, told me when I was in college, I really started getting questioned on this whole subject because I believed in God, but I was an evolutionist. And so it really, I really struggled with that. And when I hit this verse, in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things and to hold fast to that which is good, which is right. And it said also, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I really got busy studying, studying science and studying the Bible and trying to figure out how it all work together. It says in, in uh, Psalms 119.160, thy word is truth. From the beginning, and every one of its righteous judgments endureth forever. There are, there's a timeline, and you might seem like I'm going to go really fast, because I probably am, because I have an awful lot that I want to share with you, but if you have questions afterwards, please bring them up. Creation's timeline. What do we have? 6,000 years ago. Yeah, seriously. There's nothing more there. A lot of people would love to believe that it's a lot longer, but that's all we can get out of the scriptures, and that's all we can get out of the fossil record, that's all we can get out of astronomy and biology and anything else you want to look at. We can only get about 6,000 years out of it. 4,300 years ago was the flood, and Jesus' birth was about zero, and then 2,000 years later, here we are. The evolutionist timeline says in the beginning, hydrogen. Not in the beginning, God, because they have to believe something was there in the beginning. Steady state theory says that something had to be there from the beginning because if something wasn't there, you can't get nothing, right? You can't get nothing, anything from nothing. And so the evolutionist timeline, basically they thought it was about 20 billion years ago. Uh, recently they've done some studies and realized they're a little bit off. Now they say it's only about 13 billion years old. That's quite a change, I think. 
So we have a foundation, and we need to know what our foundation is. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We need to know why we believe what we believe. And we need to hold fast to that. People say, Mr. Hansen, you're awful dogmatic. But you know, if I'm not dogmatic, then I really don't believe what I believe. I have to, believe, I have to be dogmatic about what I believe. And I believe everyone should be dogmatic. It's not, somebody said last week, they said, Mr. Hansen, you've got to be open-minded. And I said, you know, I'd really rather be Bible-minded. Let, let the Bible be my guide. Let the Bible be my director. And so everything that we understand is on the foundation of Genesis. You want to talk about the family? Where does it start? In Genesis. Where does, fa- uh, where does marriage start? In Genesis. And just about anything you can come up with, it all starts there in Genesis. That is our foundation for everything. God said in Psalm 33, 6, through 6 and 9, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. He says in Isaiah, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretched forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. You know, he didn't need any help from anybody. He didn't need any help from any system. He said he spoke it, it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. I believe him. I believe him because my greatest joy in high school was biology. I aced every test in biology. And at the end end of the year, I had almost all the bonus points that they could give you. You know, I I got almost all those right. And then the guy only gave me a 99. And I thought, well, that's wrong. He said, well, nobody's perfect. Oh, well. It says in Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All the things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. Evolution must have time. Not a little bit of time. In fact, there isn't enough time for evolution to happen. But I like this. Evolution must have time. Time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait, and time itself performs miracles. Evolution. Evolutionary scientists must realize that evolution means the, that the, means the initial formation of unknown organisms from unknown chemicals produced in an atmosphere or ocean of unknown composition under unknown conditions, which organisms have climbed an unknown evolutionary ladder, leaving unknown evidence. You say, we have so much evidence. No, we really don't. And if you would do any searching yourself into those into those evidences that they have, you will find that their evidence is very meager and it does not help them in the least. Simply stated, evolution may be defined as an imagined process by which living things form by themselves without a creator, then somehow improved by themselves. According to this belief, all bacteria, plants, animals, and humans have arisen by mere chance from a single remote ancestor that somehow came into existence And all of this is supposed to have occurred accidentally without the benefit of any any intelligence or planning? It just all happened by itself? Dirt is not that smart. Chemicals break down in Earth's systems. They don't come together and make something complex. Water is the last place that anything could come together because water is, is an acid. It breaks molecules apart. It doesn't put them together. We also have the laws of thermodynamics that we really need to think strongly about. The first law of thermodynamics, nothing, in the simple words, nothing can be created or destroyed of itself. 
Nothing can come into existence by itself. That's, that's a law of science that the evolutionists believe in. Second law that scientists all believe in is that all things go from order to disorder. They rust, fade, corrode, degenerate, die. Everything goes downhill. Just take a Lamborghini and stick it out in the, in the back 40. Leave it there for 30 years. You think it's going to be better? It's going to be more complex? I don't think so. Things go downhill. In any system you have, things are going to deteriorate. In the beginning, there was a Big Bang. There's over a hundred different theories about the Big Bang. We think it happened this way. We think it happened that way. None of them know really how it happened. We also have the laws of biogenesis. This is biology. So all life originates from pre-existing life of the same kind. A living thing can only originate from a parent similar to itself. Did you get that? That is really, really important. All life originates from pre-existing life of the same kind. A living organism can only originate from a parent similar to itself. Do you believe there's enough information in a worm to make a person or a bird? The information that's in a worm makes a worm. That's all that's in there. There's nothing else. And if you damage any of that information, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be a damaged worm. We look at, very quickly, we're going to look at the origin of life. Evolution. You have to have trillions and trillions of damages going in the exact same direction, all damaging the information to produce life. I don't know about you, but that just seems ludicrous to me. One of the thoughts to try to push this out of the way is aliens. It's called panspermia. Life exists throughout the universe, they say, distributed by space dust, meteor meteorites, um, asteroids, comets, planetoids, whatever. And that's just pushing the problem farther out and you still have no answers. Uh, the only other option is God as creator. Perfection. Perfect. Until sin came into the world. And that wasn't God's choice. God didn't want cancer and disease and, and horrible disasters and all this going on in the world today. He didn't choose that. Man chose that. He chose to turn away from God's plan and go under Satan's work. So we had a payment that had to be paid, and God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for that, for our payment, that all could live if they chose. Aliens, let's go to Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself performed the earth and made it. He hath established it, the earth. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. He doesn't talk about any other place in the, in the universe to do that. And there's none else. Acts 17, 26, And God hath made of one blood all nations dwell upon the face of the earth. He created everybody to live on earth. And if you want to say, well, yeah, but the Bible doesn't really go there, you're right. That's the point. The Bible doesn't go there. This book was written for people on earth that we would know him, the one true God. And he doesn't tell us anything about anything beyond this earth. And for us to try to look at time is really difficult. I shouldn't do this. But do you know how fast the speed of light is? 286,000 miles per second. 284 miles. And if you could travel 286,000 miles a second for 10 seconds, how far out would you be? Quite a ways? How about for 20 seconds? How about a half hour traveling 186,000 miles every second? And if you could do that for a day, 24 hours, traveling 186,000 miles every second. 
for 24 hours. Are you a long ways out there? How about for a month, six months, a year? Do you realize the nearest star to us is Alpha, Alpha Centauri, Alpha approximately the double star? That's 4.3 light years away. 4.3 light years away, traveling at the speed of light for four and a half years, you would just get to the nearest star to us. So if there's anything out there, folks, we're not going to find it. And I'm not going to try. George Wald, talking about the origin of life, he said, if life comes only from life, does this mean that there was always life on the earth? It must. Yet we know that that cannot be so. We know that the world was once without life, that life appeared later. But how? We think it was by spontaneous generation. Do you know what spontaneous generation is? One day, you're really sick of the garbage sitting in the house, and you take the, take the garbage outside, and you stick it outside the house, and wait for your husband to go put it in the trash can. And it sits there. A few days later, you look at that thing, you got flies coming all over that thing. Spontaneous generation. The garbage turned into flies. That's what they believed at one time. They believed that you had a pond that was scummy and it sat there for too long. Frogs would spontaneously generate. Wowie, they would come. Now, here's a scientist. He's supposed to be really smart, right? And he says, if... Now, if I could only create life in a test tube, I could prove that it did not take an intelligent designer. Mm -hmm. Frogs arising spontaneously from the soup. There was a, a scientist that did an experiment. He took some grain and he added some rags to it and he put it in the shed for 21 days. And when he came back to look at it, wow! Mice! They spontaneously generated from the grain. You say, that's silly. But that is what they believed at one time. We're always learning. That's true. But let's not move into fairy tales. And you get mice. So let's look at the world in the beginning. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And that earth that he originally created was without form and void. It had no form yet, and it was empty yet. There was nothing there. And the Lord said, after it was all done, he said, after the, the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters, he said in verse 5, let there be light. And there was light. This was an incredible world at one time in Earth's history. People lived how long? Hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, Noah was 950 years. Methuselah was 969 years old. And you can go down the list. They, they were really old. And you say, but maybe the timeline was wrong. No, because right after the flood, their, they, their years of, went down very quickly. There was something really special about that original world that God created, that they could live these long time, long time periods. And as we look at the fossil record, we see that same thing. We see an amazing world. It says in, in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse... In verses... Um, I'm going to go to... Uh, verse 5 I'm going to start at. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the face of the earth to water the whole face of the ground. God had created, if you look at later on in chapter 2, God had put a firmament in the midst of the waters. He put waters above the firmament, the space, the sky, and he put waters below that ferment. And it did not rain, but a mist came up from the, across the earth to water the whole face of the ground. 
It also, that water vapor canopy or blanket that we believe possibly could have existed by what the word says, then it would have hindered the ultraviolet radiation of the sun. It would have bounced that back into space. Ultraviolet radiation was one of the largest aging processes that we have. And the longer you're exposed to ultraviolet radiation, the, that's where you're, you get older and older and older looking. And so before that flood, they, people could live a lot longer. We also find in the fossil record, as geologists, we find amazing sizes of animals. You know of some of them, but armadillos 12 feet long, as long as a, uh, as a station wagon, penguins five feet tall, dragonflies with a, four, or a six foot wingspan, cockroaches 13 inches long, the, the megalodon, the great white, up to 80 feet long in the pre-flood world. That's incredible. What an amazing size. What a time did they live. We also find that millipedes got to five and a half feet long. Beavers, five feet long. Incredible sizes, six foot long. This one was only six feet long. Uh, marsupials, as big as a minivan. Rodents as big as minivans. Um, salamanders, eight feet long. Donkeys, over nine feet at the shoulders. And sloths, over 20 feet long. This is all documented by the fossil record. And on and on we could go. There was an incredible world at one time in Earth's history that people were a part of. And we saw the large things that were out there. What are some other large things that we saw at that time in Earth's history? You know, when we think about dinosaurs, which we'll talk about in a little bit, they were some of those huge things. Do you realize reptiles continue to grow all their life? As long as they're alive, they will continue to grow. Many of them didn't grow very long because their rate of growth was very slow. Others grew incredible sizes because they grew continually. Fish continually grow. And, and amphibians and reptiles. So now let's take a peek at the world at its worst. What happened? Well, we see that in Genesis chapter 6, we see that man became very, very wicked. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. That was against God's plan. God wanted the Sathly line to stay Sathly, not to see every woman out there that they wanted for themselves and take whatever they wanted. They corrupted the seed. And God said, the wickedness of man is great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. It repenteth God that he had made man. It grieved him to his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping in and fowl the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. And then the flood. He didn't, do you realize that everything, every part of the creation is connected to man? It's all connected. When you affect man, you affect the whole creation. And that's exactly what we saw. It was, was it a really a worldwide flood? And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. He didn't say this was a local flood here and a local flood there and a local flood there. He said, I'm going to wipe it all out and it's all going to be gone. It will, if it was only a local flood, then why was there an ark? If it's only a local flood, you just move. Right? Why did each kind of land animal need to be put on the ark? If it's, a, if it's only a local flood, then you just take the animals from your locale and put them on the ark or put them in the boat to take them to the other side. Why were there birds needed on the ark? They can fly. They don't need a boat. Then... Were only some of the people wicked? If this was only a local flood, and he only destroyed a portion, then only those people were bad? That's not what God said, is it? Then God is a liar, because he said he would destroy the entire earth. 
How long did the flood last? We're not going to go into that. We are going to realize that it took 371 days. And the Genesis flood, we see the cause, man's wickedness. We see the consequence, the destruction of all creation. We see the course of action that was taken to cleanse the entire earth. We see the catastrophe, water overflowed the whole earth. And we see the culmination, all life on land died. You know, people don't realize it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but that is not where most of the water came from. Do you remember where God says the fountains of the great, great deep burst open? All over the earth. There were not only tsunamis and tidal waves and earthquakes, volcanoes on every part of the earth. We see that in the rock today. This earth was destroyed with volcanic action and and geothermal activity that is unthinkable, and earthquakes and everything. This was, and then that lasted for 150 days, by the way. That water stayed at its highest peak for 150 days. Then it started going down. But it didn't, it, the whole thing lasted 371 days. God said he gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He laid up the depths of the storehouses. It was a terrible time. Psalms 104, 6, Thou covers it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. How many mountains do you know of that if they're covered with water, the whole world is covered with water? I mean, that's an awful low mountain if it doesn't cover the, the world, does it, isn't it? This was a terrible catastrophe. A local flood? I don't think so. It's not going to fit what the Word of God says. Let's look at the fossil record for a moment. By the way, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for it is foolishness unto him. Neither can he know it because it is spiritually discerned. To the world, what I am teaching is nonsense. But they don't know my God. They don't know his power. They don't know his majesty and his glory and his salvation. If they knew that, they might think a little bit differently. There was, in the fossil record, when we look at the first fossil record, there's nothing in the Precambrian. There actually is, but they don't like us to know that. Evolutionary scientists believe there's nothing in the Precambrian rock, the bottom rocks of the earth, nothing there, even though we have found some fish and some other, um, other animals there. But in the Cambrian, that's what most of Wisconsin is, Cambrian, that Cambrian was a Cambrian explosion. Trillions and trillions of animals just exploded into being right now. Oh, wait a minute. If there was nothing, how'd you get everything? Every phylum that's in our world today was in that first Cambrian explosion. They're not, they're not simple. If evolution is true, there should be simple stuff there at the beginning. And they got more and more and more complex. But what we see is complexity from the very beginning. Some of these animals had eyes. I mean, they had, they had all kinds of very complex structures that nobody would say evolved within a short time by itself. All this from, from what? From where? The process of fossilization is very, very important. When an animal dies, if you, if you, if you shoot a deer and you can't find it, what happens to it? Does it get eaten up? Yeah, most likely, coyotes, whatever, birds, they ravage it, it's gone. And, and it continues to decay, it doesn't take very long before it's all gone. Oh, after a while, you're going to see some of the bones yet, right? How long does it take before the bones are gone? Do you realize the rodents eat the bones? You might find the skull, but if you look closely at the skull, if it's been there any length of time, you'll see that it's been gnawed on. That is not going to fossilize, is it? It's going to be gone. In order to have fossilization, by the way, in water, living things dies, it bloats and floats to the top. Something major, a major catastrophe had to force these things down and bury them very, that quickly. They had to be buried so quickly and so deeply to get away from any oxygen, bacteria, and scavengers that would destroy them. The plant or animal remains 
are turned into stone. They're lithified. You say that takes millions of years. No, it can take a very short time. I have a picture of a boot, a fossilized boot with a fossilized leg bone in it. It probably didn't take millions of years for that to happen. We find now that coal can be made naturally in one year. We realize that in order to see a fossil, you're, it's going to have to be exposed. And you know, when we find those bones, my family got to do a lot of digging up, a lot of dinosaur bones and other things. And what you find is if they are exposed to air, they break down. There's still organic material there. Even though they might have been fossilized, there's still some organic material there. If evolution is true, that shouldn't be. What is evolution? Evolution means the change from one kind of animal into another kind of animal. That's evolution. When they believe that a fish turns into an into, into a amphibian, or the amphibian turns into a reptile, or a reptile turns into a bird. That's evolution. We call that macroevolution. That's the mainstay behind evolution. And you say, but what about all those small changes that we see within all kinds of animals and plants and everything else? We call that microevolution. A microevolution are those differences. How many dogs kinds are there? Hundreds? Are they all dogs? Oh, yeah, I guess they all are. Now, do you see a dog turning into a bear? You haven't seen one yet. Dogs always are dogs. What about cats? Are they always cats? Turn into a lion or a cougar? No, they, they, they stay cats. And that's all they are. We, I, I would rather not use the word microevolution because it confuses people too much. I'd rather that they use the word variation within the kind. What we see is variation within the kind. We see adaptation. We see natural selection. Natural selection is a real thing. But natural selection can only use the information that's already there to move on, to go forward. It can't take information from the environment and stick it inside and say, wow, I've got new information now. So the only mechanism that evolution has is mutation, a damage within the genetic information. And you know, we see a lot of mutations out there, but none of them are beneficial. They're all deleterious, they're all damaging. Our faith brings expectations. What we expect to find as Christians, if we were to look at our world today, and what would we expect to find if God's word is true? We would expect to find separate and distinct kinds. And that's what we find throughout the fossil record. And that's what we see on our earth today. We would expect intelligent design in everything that we see. Every eye, every finger, every hair, every, everything that is incredibly designed. We would expect things to get worse over time because sin came into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. And the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now because of man's sin. Everything's dying, rusting, corroding, degenerating. Fading away. We would expect extinction of species. We would expect things to become extinct. Do you know, they, you know, they talk about the dinosaurs becoming extinct. You know, that's only a small portion of the reptile world. What about birds? Have any birds become extinct? Oh, yeah. Amphibians? Fish? Yeah, absolutely. We, everything come, becomes extinct. Evolution should expect transitional forms. Not just one here and one there. Come on. If everything is changing from this to that, or this to that, then you should have trillions of transitional forms. There should be beneficial mutations throughout the fossil record. We should be able to see things get better over time. You think we're getting better? <laughs> I shouldn't ask that question. And then a new species come into existence. That's what they would expect to see. So if evolution were true, there ought to be a continuous progression. There are trillions of mammals in the fossil record. 
trillions of true birds in the fossil record, trillions of reptiles and trillions of amphibians and, and trillions of, of dolphins and, and all the different kinds of, and all the, uh, all the different kinds of animals. There, there should be trillions of every kind. We find mammals, we find true birds, and we find reptiles, amphibians, and fish. But we don't find any transitional forms. Take their information, look at it very closely. What they give you a picture of is they find, find this piece of a bone, and they make the whole rest of the animal, and here's what it looked like. If this were true, this fish is swimming along one day and all of a sudden he gets mutated. The next generation gets mutated and he gets mutated. And over generations he gets worse and worse. And then it just gets worse and worse. Over time he, he ends up growing these nubs and these nubs end up being legs and the back tail fin turns into a tail. And then he just continues to change. And over time... So where are all the fishy manders? If evolution is true... There ought to be billions of fishymanders. Everything in between, this one and that one, it ought to be in the fossil record somewhere. When we look at the fossil record, I went to the Specimen Ridge out in, Yellow, and out in, uh, out in Utah, in, in Yellowstone National Park, that part of it. And Specimen Ridge has hundreds of thousands of trees, logs, that are straight up and down, that were all buried very quickly, very rapidly. And we find these all over the world, by the way. They're everywhere. Look what happened in, Spe in Spirit Lake. Scientists estimate there are 20,000 trees in the bottom of Spirit Lake. Many of them are buried upright, and some of are already 15 feet deep in the sediments. They seem to settle out by species, giving the, giving the appearance of a complete forest, because that's what they told us. Well, it was this forest layer, and then that forest layer took over, and this little forest layer took over. Well, where'd all the sediment come from, by the way, to bury this one, and then bury that one, and then bury that one? Where's all that sediment coming from to do all this? Willingly ignorant, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. A look at the age of the earth. I can't go through this. We don't have time. In order to have radiometric dating work, you have to know how much material was there in the beginning. Carbon-14 turns into nitrogen-14. You have to know how much carbon-14 was there in the beginning. You can't just look at the nitrogen-14 that's there now. You have, to, uh, you have to believe you know how much has been contaminated or leached out, or if there has been any contamination or leaching. We use potassium argon as the most used method, and potassium combines with many different chemicals to make all different kinds of salts. And argon, which is a noble gas, dissipates out. So how much was there in the beginning and what happened all the way through and what was contaminated, what was leached out, what was changed? There's no way of knowing. There's absolutely no way of knowing. And the rate of decay, you have to believe that's never changed. And we know that that's wrong. We know that the rate of decay of different chemicals, elements, have changed the rate of decay. What are you going to do? How many... Have you ever gone to... Um, to a cave and seen a stalactite or a stalagmite. They tell you, well, each inch takes a thousand years to form, or maybe a hundred years to form. It depends on who, you, who you're listening to. We went down to the Cave of the Mounds. I was doing a lecture down there, and my son uh, heard the guide that was next to me say, and these take a hundred years for every inch. And my son looked back at him and said, Sir, then why is that light fixture all covered in stalactite material? Is that over 100 years old? You know, we can ask simple questions and get pretty good answers. This is the bat that's been hanging there. We, have, we can go to the Lincoln Monument and find, I mean, these are supposed to take hundreds of years for each inch, and yet 
Lincoln Monument or mines that have been there for 50 years are filled with stalactite and stalagmite material? What about the dinosaurs? What about dinosaurs? I want you, I want you to know something. Man created the word dinosaur. 1840. That's not that long ago. 1840, they started finding some big bones. And they said, let's call this, Richard Owen came out with this and said, let's call it dinosaur, which means monstrous or terrible lizard. Do you realize that out of the 153 different kinds of dinosaurs, there's really only about 53 different kinds of dinosaurs, and most of them aren't dinosaurs. Do you know some of what we call fish are called dinosaurs? Ichthyostega, you know, and many others. Uh, what about the birds? Do they call any birds dinosaurs? Archaeopteryx and the Tertua, many others. When we look at um, the mammals, do you realize that most of the, what we call dinosaurs were actually mammals? When we look at dinosaurs, we realize we're just looking at an animal that's once lived. It was in a time period when things got really, really big. So we see a lot of big animals. You say, but the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs. That's because the word dinosaur wasn't invented. But if you go back, it does talk about dragons 10 times. Or you can look up Tanim. You can look up the Leviathan. You can look up the uh, Behemoth. Behold not behemoth which I made with thee. Eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins and the forces and the muscle of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar tree and the sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like strong pieces of bronze. His bones like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He is the biggest creature God ever created. And there it is in the Bible. He talks about Leviathan. I'm not going to talk about that. So, uh, go to Job 40 and 41 and learn about these incredible creatures that did roam our earth at one time. And there's Behemoth, that long cedar-like tail. A lot of people think he was just a hippopotamus. I don't think so. I think their tail's kind of real small, don't you think? Didn't work real well. Leviathan, what they eat. Well, we could talk about that. What about finding dinosaurs? Today we find dinosaurs and we're finding fresh, we're finding blood vessels, blood cells. If they're only hundreds of years old, this stuff should be gone. But yet it's still in the dinosaurs. So they can only be thousands of years old at the very most. But we're still finding it. And this is not just one. This is dozens of cases now where they have found dinosaurs with blood cells and blood vessels throughout the animal. What about the ape men? I would love to do this, but I can't. I want to go to the back end of this because there's a couple things just before we change. Ramapithecus was only made out of a, a jawbone. And, but they could tell you, show you what the whole animal looked like. Uh, Zingenthropus. They had three different specialists make put the skin and hair back on it. And they all look just exactly alike, don't they? Uh, tongue baby, um, Lucy, is in Australia pithecine. We have found almost every bone of the Australia pithecines now, and they find that they have very long arms, very long skinny fingers. They have the possible thumb on the foot. They're, the bones in the hip are pivoted so that they would have been on all fours. The, the ear balance bones show us that they were on all fours also. So we, and their brain capacity was only 350 cc's to 500 cc's. Ours is 1,350 cc's. Lucy was named after a, a song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Um, they, but they do have Lucy in, in the museum with feet and hands before they found any feet and hands, and they made them look like they had human feet and hands when they didn't have any yet. None were found with the bones. We find in the Laetaliash in Tanzania, we find walkways of people. And this is supposedly at the time of the dinosaurs, because we find the footprints of dinosaurs and the footprints of people in the same strata. And Piltdown Man was a fraud. 
gibbon, skull cap, jaw of orangutan, some bones of people. Uh, I like Java Man myself. No, that's not Java Man. This is Java Man. Uh, a leg bone with three teeth were found 50 feet away. The femur, identical to a human femur. Conclusion, the skull cap is ape, the leg bone is human. This is what they've done to all the different pieces that they have found. Well, there's a book it's by uh, Lubnow. I forget his first name right now. But uh, Dr. Lubnow wrote a book on every legitimate piece of bone that's ever been found of man or ape man or whatever. And he's done all the study. He's aged it all. They're all dated. They're all categorized. And he can show you what everything is. It's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. They found a tooth in Nebraska. And they made a whole new ape man out of Nebraska man. And then they found out that that tooth belonged to an extinct pig. So I'm going to give it back to you because my time is up. Could probably let you go longer. Well, we could have, but then they would never get to bed. Any questions, right? All right, we're going to start with you guys. Do you guys have any questions? First of all, let's, let's thank them, huh? All right, questions. Where'd you get your ties? Oh, <laughs> my wife got it for me on the internet. <laughs> She got most of my ties for me. I have, a, I have a tie for each topic that I usually speak on. So this is usually my What's your marriage tie. one look like? Huh? What's your marriage one look like? My marriage one? It has hearts all say. over it. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Answers in Genesis is a lot of good ties. Yeah, one of your first slides, you got like the time scale. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, um, is, all right, your, one of your first couple of slides you had the time scale and it started at 6,000, zero to 2,000. Mm -hmm. So is the 6,000 based on the zero mark or is it based on the 2,000 mark? So it'd be... Yeah, that's, it, it'd I be, think that might be misleading a little bit. You know, 2,000 years back to Christ right. and then 4,300 years back to the flood and then 6,000 years back to the beginning, just so you don't get confused about that. But that's right. Thank you. I feel like eight. That's good. Sounds fine. I'll start with one. Okay. So like looking from like the evolutions, evolutionist viewpoint, so if we evolve from monkeys, how are we not, like, not still seeing people evolving from them? Like, why did we just You know, stop? that is one of my biggest questions that I ask evolutionists. If we evolved from monkeys, then monkeys should still be evolving into people, and we should still be able to see, and, and I'm talking about every kind of animal that exists. We should, be able, we should never be able to tell where the fish leave off and the amphibians start, or the amphibians leave off and the, republic, or the reptiles start. We should never be able to tell where the apes leave off and man starts if evolution is true, because it would be continually going in every direction because mutations happen all the time. Go ahead. Ask them all. Alright, so I got one on Noah's Ark. So how did Noah get animals that were on the other half of the world onto his ark? Like, it takes a long time to get there. First of all, most of all the world was land. 70% of the world was land before the flood. Yeah. And we see that by the fossil record and by, you know, stratigraphic imagery. And Noah didn't have to put, take any, get any of the animals to come. God brought them to him. So you said, when God said all living things shall die, like, did he include fish in that? Like, how does that work? Like, did Okay, let, that's a very, very good question. I usually answer that question when I'm doing my lecture on that topic. Um, and what he says is, he says, everything on land that breathed air died. 
So the fish being in the water, and it was a water catastrophe, they didn't all die. Most of them still did die because you're talking about volcanoes all over the earth, earthquakes everywhere. Even you have zonation, you have fresh water mixing with the salt water all over the world, and that is very bad <laughs> for the fish. And so when that happened, most of them died, but evidently some of them survived because we do have. But God says everything on land and everything that breathed air died. Okay, so like, how did some fish just switch to fresh water and some fish stay in salt water? Because it must have all been salt water. How can they just like switch to fresh water? Like, they had to have somehow. Well, we know that it wasn't all salt water in the beginning. Um, when God set up the system, He set up a system whereby the fresh water from the earth would come up and water the whole face of the ground not with salt water that would kill the plants. So evidently, he already had it separated how he was going to have salt water and fresh water. The amount of salt in the ocean, though, is very, very interesting. If you take the amount of salt we have today in our oceans and add and, and multiply how much is being added to it every year, you can only go back about 5,000 years. Very interesting. We see that with radiometric dating and a number of different things. Go ahead. Okay, so switching to like the UV rays and stuff. So like they've had people that like are allergic to the sun and they've been inside like their whole lives. Mm. And that didn't seem to affect their aging as much. Like they've done research on it and like it didn't affect their aging as much. So like I don't understand like if I... Ultraviolet radiation doesn't care if you're in a house or not. It doesn't care if you're in a bubble or not. The radiation from the sun is going to affect you, and it's going to aid you. And you can say, well, I'm shielding myself from it. Well, I'm sorry, you're really not. If you stay in, out, out of the sun, yes, some of the radiations. Now there's a lot of different kinds of radiations coming from the sun, right? A lot of very damaging radiations. And most of those don't care about your wood or your shingles. It goes right through it. They're so tiny. In fact, we have, we have instruments miles down into the Earth's crust where we have, that we can measure certain um, items, uh, rays that come from the sun and go right down to the Earth and hit that thing and never touched a sand particle before hitting. It's that tiny. Incredible. The, the, the design of it all is absolutely amazing. And I think that's what hits me so strongly is the incredible design. Everything works perfectly with everything else. There's not one part of the system of our earth that doesn't affect or is affected by everything else in our whole world. It's all effective. And so I think we can do some more research on that subject of, you know, being shielded, but I know that the radiation doesn't care if you're in a house or not, you're still going to age. All right, so according to Google, human DNA is 98% related to chimpanzees. <laughs> what about that 2% separates us from being chimpanzees? Actually, the 98% that they took is they took it from a place where there's only mainly the same DNA as chimpanzees and humans. If you look at the whole chimpanzee as a whole, that number is way off. Um, but it doesn't matter whether it is or isn't. If you look at the um, DNA of any organism to any other organism, you're going to find that there's incredible similarities because you have the same designer. He didn't, use, he didn't use totally different information to make this one as he made that one, or to make this reptile, or to make that fish, or to make that bird. He used all the same information, DNA, is what makes, maintains, and repairs us, is the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And so that information is not going to be that much different. But what is different and, and I think you, you could look up this very carefully in the, and find this information for yourself. They are not able to process like people. 
Their brain capacity is, like I said, 350 to 500 cc's. Ours is 1,350 cc's. Do you know the Neanderthal's brain capacity was larger than ours? So something that could be looked in on more, I think. But um, I've read it all, but so much. I've forgotten more than I've ever read. So, so but yeah, I think, I think it's because of the common design, designer. Go ahead. What was Lucy if she wasn't a human, though? She was a chimpanzee. Chimpan? Right. Mm -hmm. um, how did 8 billion people come from 2? How did what? 8 billion people come from 2. I'm sorry, I'm missing it, the question. How did uh, 8 billion people come from Adam and Eve? Oh, people. thank you. 8 billion people come from Adam and Eve. <laughs> thank you. My mind wasn't processing the, the question. Um, first of all, if you go to science, science says that we all come back to one person. Eve, mitochondrial Eve. Um, and uh, how does that happen? If you take two people, I love to do this population thing. I have a whole talk on population and how they want to get rid of people. <laughs> but um, 8 billion people, it doesn't take very long at all. If you took, and I have a slide that I don't have with me, um, if you take two people, and then you have four people, and then you have eight people, and then you have 16 people, it takes a very, very short time. In fact, you would have a lot more people on the earth than you have, of course. Uh, eight billion people would only take... In fact, um, from the early 1900s, there was already... There was only... Uh, let me put that... There was only... I believe, if my remembrance of my charts are right, there was only 2 billion people on the earth back in the early 1900s. Where have we come in just 100 years? You know, it, it multiplies so fast. And because of medicine and because of protections and, and all that, we end up with, you know, we end up with a pandemic that we isolate everybody from everybody so nobody gets sick. But there was a day when, when, when the pandemics came, they just died. And then you started with the people that were left. Um, if you go back to the potato famines, you go back to the, all the different ones, early 1900s, you know, a lot of people died because they didn't control it. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to open up to any adults. Any adults have any questions? I want to clarify one thing. Um, the, when I was trying to come up with the speed of light, I was mumbling. <laughs> and the speed of light is 186,284 miles a second. Just to clarify that back where it should be. Here are uh, two more questions coming from other sources. So why can't evolution and God exist? Why couldn't God create something and then evolution finish the process? He could have, but he didn't. That, that, that's the answer. I mean, God could have done it any way he wanted to do it. But he says, I did it by myself. I didn't need any system. I didn't need any devices. I didn't need anything happening. I did it myself. I spoke. It was done. That, that was it. And, and when he did it, he tells us exactly how he did it. And when you look at the days of creation, you realize you can't mess it up. Because every time the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day, is connected with a number, it always means a literal day. First day, second day, third day, fourth day. He made it very specific that you would understand. Also on the fourth day, in, or when, when he goes to uh, verse 14 in Genesis when he's creating, he says, and the earth brought, yeah, well, that's the wrong verse here. Uh, okay. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. He just answered the question. What are seasons? What are days? What are years? He divided it all out, and he said, let them, the sun and the moon and the stars, be 
for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And like I said, and we could go through a big long study on the word yom, but we won't do that. As question pertains, and it actually goes with your, your days, what other scriptures, or aside from the Bible saying day one, God created day and night, day two, God created this, how can you prove a seven literal day creation? Um, well, that was, that's where, where we were going. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. Okay? He's taking all the light part of the day, and all the dark part of the day, and he's dividing the two. So he's going to answer the question and he says, and God called the light part of the day, what? Day. And he called the dark part of the day, what? Night. And the evening and the morning were what? The first day. I, I don't know, do you really need more than that? I don't, but what oh. about the idea of... <laughs> Light and dark, the days being longer as we see something that's um, well, if gotten you try, faster over if time. If you try to do that, what happens is, what happens to your creation? God created all the plants on day three. But if they were there for hundreds or thousands of years without animals, it, it doesn't work. And you can't have... You can't have the first day without the second. Everything had to be within a space of very short time. That comes to the question of how do you know that Adam and Eve didn't have a child in the Garden of Eden? Because it was a very short amount of time. They didn't even have a child till they were cast out of the garden. So it had to be a very short amount of time. But yeah, look at, you read Genesis very carefully about the days and realize what has to happen to the plants. What about photosynthesis? What about this? What about this? If the sun and the moon, are, sun and moon aren't there yet, right? They're not created till the fourth day. So how are you going to have photosynthesis? How are they going to even survive without the sun and the moon and the stars? till a thousand years later. That verse in Psalm 100 and, 100 and, oh, I hate my mind sometimes. It says that God said that a day was as a thousand years. What he's talking about is not that every day was a thousand years. He said, in my scheme of things, when I look down on the earth, everything's it, time is non-existent. He is outside of time. And that's all he was trying to say by that verse. In that verse 4, uh, he is outside of time. So, yeah, you can't, have the, you can't have plants for a thousand years without the sun. Yep. Yep. Thank you. You, you agree. Awesome. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. First one's pretty easy. So how old is the earth? What is it, like 2, How old is the Earth? Yeah. The Earth is about 6,000 years old. Okay. Um, That's according to Russ Hansen's theory. So, before Adam and Eve sinned, um, were there, like, thorn bushes or mosquitoes? Because, like, couldn't you, like, you didn't feel pain? Um, or you didn't have pain? There was no, there were mosquitoes. But if you understand biology much, you understand it's, the females that always bite you. The males don't. The males get all the protein they need out of the plants. But women are never satisfied. When things changed, they couldn't get enough of the protein they needed for their reproduction. And so then they started getting the protein from animals. Before that, as far as we can see, there wasn't a problem. Thorns and thistles, there wouldn't have been thorns and thistles. 
that came from a mutation that happened probably to the plants, you know, after the sin came into the world. The whole creation was corrupted, and it all started to die. It all started to degenerate. It all started to mutate. And so it was all affected. And that's when thorns and thistles started coming into being. Um, so this one isn't really about creation. It's more about the creation of, like, languages. So, like, what was the first language that was created? And, like, during the Tower of Babel, was God genuinely, like, he probably wasn't scared that they'd build all the way up to him. He just didn't like the idea of that. So is that why he... He, he commanded them to fill the earth. They were disobeying him. They were rejecting him as God. And so he said, I want you to scatter and fill the earth. And they decided, no, we're going to keep all the minds together. We need all the smarts we can have because if I don't have Adam with me, I'm just not going to be able to get things done right. You know, and I, and I, and I need Terry to help me with this and this. So we got to stay together. Or if I try to go off on my own, I'll be a mess. And God took, and he took that one language, and he made it confused. Every, every groups of people had their own language. Where do you get your races from? You have groups, and they aren't races, by the way. They're people groups, just so you understand. There's only one race. It's called the human race, and we all belong to it. But anyway, so you get these people groups, and they're all separated out now. They, they aren't going to marry with any other group. They're marrying their own group because that's the only one they can understand. You know, and, and so they end up with the, uh, the, the genetic information combining and they're going to have browner skin. They're going to have lighter skin. They're going to have darker skin. They're going to have yellower skin. They're going to have blonde hair. They're going to have brown hair. That's when all the division of the, all the varieties started was at the Tower of Babel. Good question, though. All right, this is fun. Any other questions? Come on. Come on. All right. Did you have something? Do you want to try to uh, describe it? Okay. There is a young man in my life about the age of these guys. And he said, um, when you're talking about creation and then the flood, he said, God made a mistake. And he had to wipe it all out. And I was like floored by that because we're taught that God is perfect and he doesn't make <laughs> mistakes. So what would be a good response <laughs> to that <laughs> seemingly logical <laughs> comment? <laughs> And I know I found a verse on it some time ago. I think it was in Genesis also. But it was, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to tell you. If he created Adam and Eve and the world went amok and sin it's was called, rampant and he had to wash out, or, you know, wipe away the earth and start again. It's a terrible thing called free will. My daughter and I were walking down Portage decades ago and she looked up at me and she said, Daddy, why didn't God just make us robots? It would have been so much easier to obey. God did not want to make us robots. He didn't want us to love him because we had to love him. He wanted us to love him because we wanted to love him. So free will. He wanted everybody to have a choice. He, wanted, he didn't want Adam and Eve to, to, to be robots. Dot, 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 this is the way it's going to be, and you will love me, and you will always obey me, and you will always, and yes, sir, I will, I will, because that's all I have in me. Well, that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted every one of us to choose him, to choose to love him. And that's why we have the dilemma today, and that's why he had to send his son. He had it all planned out. He, he has foreknowledge. He knew what man was going to do. But he already had a plan to set man free. But man chose that direction. God will not take away his choice. Adam and Eve chose wrong. God didn't want them to choose wrong. 
They chose wrong because they wanted to choose wrong. God weeps because of the decisions we make. It breaks his heart to see us turn away from him and disobey him in his commands and his word. But he's not going to force you to love him. If you want to walk into hell, you are free to do so. But he didn't make hell for us. He made it for Satan and his angels that were cast down. He did not make it for the rest of us. We are not meant to be there. Can you speak a little bit into gender dysphoria and where we live in this world and the society now of... Transgender? Neutrality, yeah, whatever you want to speak into. Well, I'm not sure what that question is. Um, when God created man, what did he create? He created a man. And when he created a woman, he created a woman. He didn't create Adam and Steve. And he didn't create Eve and whatever. What's gotten confused is we've taken God out of the equation. And so what happens is, when we take God out of the equation, we do things the way we want them done. A man is still a man whether he looks like a woman or not. The genetics say he's a man. It doesn't matter what he does to his body. It doesn't matter what she does towards her body. They can feel like a boy or a girl. They can feel however they want to feel. And nobody in here is going to judge them because it's not our job to judge them. I'm not going to judge them. That's their choice. But God didn't make them that way. They chose to go that direction. And it hurts to see people take away what God gave them and make it something that is false because it is false. But I, I, I promise you, if any person came to me and said, and it was a, person, a man that came and said they were a woman, I'd say, okay, let's, what do you want to talk about? I mean, it, it is none of my business. I'm not their judge. God will judge. And I don't think God is going to judge that. He's going to judge the heart. It, it's not what you do to yourself. It's who you believe in. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What does God want? He wants our heart. He wants our heart. He wants our mind. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to obey him. All these other issues, we've messed up. We've confused. We've made it a mess. And I, I'm sad, but I will still share the gospel with any that I meet. I, genetically, they either are what God, they're what God created them or not. Are they mutated? Are there some mutations out there? Yes, there are some mutations out there. But that doesn't mean they're not a man or a woman. That means they're just mutated. And that's a shame. That's what this world has done because of sin. I hope I was able to answer most of your questions. And if you ever want to get a hold of me and talk to me, he knows my number. I think. Yeah, I do. <laughs> last chance. Any other last questions before we pray and we'll head out? Oh, I love you. Go ahead. Okay, last one. So it's kind of broad, but when God created language, did he create bad words, or is that just something no. humans came up with? I think, that's, I think that's something people came up with. So that they, they why slang is, things. They, but they in, take the name of the Lord, their God, in vain. That word is real, but it wasn't meant to be used like that. So some of the words are real. Damn is real, but that was to mean something like this, not to damn somebody. Only God can damn somebody. We can't. Yeah, but the Bible says, like, blasphemy, you, you can't say, like, bad words. Like, we created them. Like, 
it's not like he's the one that created them. Like he's not telling us not to do that. Like, is it just the he whole created thing? the language? He didn't create the corruption of the language. Yeah. So like, is it so a swear word is basically just saying like you suck, like saying you suck, or saying like you are. That's an expletive. Swear word. And so expletives like were never allowed in our house. You could say, when we were bringing up our eight children, the one thing that could not happen in our house is our children can never use an expletive. That's saying something to somebody without, exp without defining what you're saying. I'm really disappointed in what you just said. Or I'm, I'm disappointed in that happening. Instead of talking, we just say, that sucks. And so our children were never allowed to say any expletives. And so they grew up in our house and knew none until they got your age. And then I'm sure they knew a few, but they didn't share them with mom and dad. <laughs> so saying a swear word is not considered a sin. It's, it, cons it's how it's used. What are you doing with it? Are you taking God's name? Or are you taking somebody's mother's name? Are you, you, are you being, you know, are you doing something with it to tear somebody down or to make... So, you know, in a, in a lot of expletives, there's really probably no damage done except to the, to the language itself because the word doesn't mean that. I mean, so if you say, not, that sucks, what does sucks mean? So it's not the word itself, it's how you're using it. It's so how you're it using it. it could not be a swear word and still, right. still be the same meaning. Okay. Then. Yeah. And you can tell what a person really means by any word that they say. If you say mother, if you say it wrong, there's something wrong with that. Right? But mother is a very nice word. So, yes, it's how you use it. And in the, in the placing, where you're placing it in the sentence and, and what's your, your, your feelings behind it, yeah, that's, that's where it's all bad. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. And then uh, uh, with the last, like, 10, 15 minutes, if you're interested, there's some ice cream bars downstairs in the freezer as well as if you're interested in playing pickleball or whatever games you want to, you're more than welcome to do that. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, we'll finish up here. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity um, to learn more about creation, evolution, and uh, just these different topics. Lord, I thank you uh, for letting Russ come down here and speak. Lord, I pray for each individual that heard this tonight. I pray that um, there would be some conviction. Um, um, I pray that there would be searching, that they would look for answers in your word. Lord, I pray that if there is any other questions or discussions to be had, I pray that they would be had, that this wouldn't be let go, that there is a Savior, there is a man named Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again, conquering death. I pray that each one of us would search that out, search a relationship with, that, with Jesus. And God, I, I praise you and thank you for creation. Thank you for making us. Thank you for loving us so much to give us a choice. And Lord, I pray that we would make uh, the right choice. Lord, I pray that you would bless us the rest of the night. I pray for good discussion. We thank you and we love you, Lord. In your son's name, amen. If anybody wants to uh, talk with Russ some more, I just totally volunteered him. He is more than happy to uh, have discussions with anybody here. <laughs> All right idea? Day age. The day age? Oh yeah, the literal days. Unformed and Unfilled is a book that was written. It's a, th it's a thicker book, but it will tear that day age theory thing right down to not, you know, you'll know exactly what it what all means. It's a very, very yep. good book. Keaton wrote it. Awesome. All right, you guys are dismissed. <laughs>